Welcome, everybody. We start in three minutes. Yeah. A very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Andreas Novi. I'm professor at this university, VU, Vienna University of Economics and Business, and president of the International Karl Polanyi Society. And I will facilitate this event, uh, which is a joint initiative of different Viennese organizations, but I'll mention them later on. We are here in the ceremonial hall of our university and uh, in Vienna, Vienna, which is home to Karl Polanyi, the world famous socio-economist who was born in Vienna in 1886. And his key book, The Great Transformation, published in 1944, investigated the political social and economic consequences of the failure of liberal capitalism in the 1930s. He tried to make sense of the disaster of fascism and war, but also reflected on the potential to foster freedom for all in a complex society. His main oeuvre has inspired research on social ecological transformation taking place in the 21st century. Indeed, like the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, current transformations will lead to different ways of living, working, and producing. And as in the revolutionary 1930s, it will most probably be accompanied by authoritarian counter-movements that threaten democracy, science, and human rights. This is why engagement with Karl Polanyi's work remains highly relevant and insightful until today. It is in this conjuncture of multiple crises that in 2018, the International Karl Polanyi Society, EKPS, was founded at the Institute of Multilevel Governance and Development at VU Vienna. It was inspired by Kari Polanyi-Levit, Karl Polanyi's daughter who celebrates her 100th anniversary on June 14 this year, in two weeks' time. Kari, who visited Vienna regularly the last time in 2019, is currently the honorary president of uh, EKPS. And in 2021, due to the initiative of Bernhard Kittel, professor at the University of Vienna, three universities, the University of Vienna, the Central European University, and Vienna University of Economics and Business set up the Vienna Karl Polanyi Visiting Professorship. Together with the IKPS, Vienna Adult Education Center, an old educational institution 
which had Karl Polanyi as one of its teachers, and supported by the City of Vienna and the Vienna Chamber of Labor, we invited distinguished scholar as visiting professor every semester. This professorship aims at deepening our understanding of ongoing transformation. The first visiting professor was Nancy Fraser, followed by Fred Block, Aishi Buka, and Bernhard Ebbinghaus. While the Austrian School of Economics of Ludwig Kies, Mises, and Friedrich Heyrich has led to an overtly simplistic understanding of the market economy, has increased inequality and social polarization. Over the last decades, the Hungarian, Austrian, Viennese citizen of the world, Karl Polanyi, has dedicated his life to promoting economic systems that serve human cooperation and solidarity. To put the economy in its place, and this place is to sustain a good life for all. But as we know today, without trespassing planetary boundaries. A huge challenge and a challenge that is at the heart of research of our current visiting professor, Julia Steinberger, but more about this in a few minutes. Before we start with two welcome addresses, uh, first by Professor Jürgen Esletzbichler, he is a full professor at the Institute for Economic Geography at WU Vienna. He has published widely in the field of urban and regional development, as well as on multiple and multi-scalar forms of inequality. Currently, he is head of the Department of Socioeconomics, a department inspired by Polanian socioeconomics. The mission statement of the, Polan uh, the department starts with acknowledging that the economy is embedded in society and biophysical processes. Professor Esselsbichler, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andreas. Um, in my role as head of department on behalf of the Vienna University of Economics and Business and the Department of Socioeconomics, I would like to welcome you all to this event. Uh, I would also like to thank the International Karl Polanyi Society, the Austrian Organization for Development and Research, and the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences for co-organizing the event and for you hosting it. Today's lecture by Julia Steinberger, Living Well Within Limits, will address one of the key challenges of our time and the fact that it is hosted by University of Economics and Business signals that the socio-ecological challenge is finally taken serious, seriously in economic and business studies. This is further underlined by the fact that Vice Chancellor Kogler will visit the university to discuss Zukunftsfähiges Wirtschaften in June and that VU just established a new study branch, economy, environment, and politics that at its core addresses the key challenge of how to understand, design, implement, and narrate the necessary changes for socially just ecological transformation. Furthermore, research by members of the VU's Research Institute Economics of Inequality highlights the link between income, consumption, and emissions, illustrating that solutions to the ecological crisis do not conflict with socially progressive politics. I do use deliberately the word transformation here and not transition, because these changes require deep intervention in our current socioeconomic system, our socioeconomic relations with other parts of the world and the natural environment, and potentially, as some argue, a reinterpretation and reconceptualization of liberal democracy demanding a decoupling of the historically evolved relation of individual freedom from affluence and the insatiable and unlimited increase of wants. As a researcher, I'm particularly looking forward to listen to one of the key thinkers and writers on the development of actual possibilities to live within planetary limits. As I'm sure you're all as excited as me to listen to Julia Steinberger's lecture, I will not take up any more of your time. But again, 
warmly welcome you, the speakers, the commentators, and in particular, Julia Steinberger, to VU and hand over to Uli Brandt, who will say a few words on behalf of ÖFSE. Thank you and welcome. Yeah, the second welcome address is by uh, Professor Ulrich Brandt, full professor for international political science and head of the Institute of Political Science at the University of Vienna. He's an expert on Latin American studies and has published widely in the field of climate research and social ecological transformation. Currently, he's also chair of the supervisory body of ÖFSE, the Austrian Foundation for Development Research, co-organizer of this event. Professor Brandt, the floor is yours. Good evening. It's nice to be back at uh, WU. Um, a warm welcome to all of you and particularly to Julia Steinberger, um, our current visiting professor. Vienna is a good place to develop and discuss radical alternatives to the escalatory capitalist system. Alternatives such as Julia's program, Living Well Within Limits. Here at WU, you have the um, social economic department and a very strong um, current of research and teaching. You have at BOKU, among others, the Institute for Social um, Ecology. At my department, we try to contribute a bit to these debates. But we have also in Vienna important initiatives. Growth and transition was important. Ministries were a part of it. The Chamber of Labour just started an initiative on social ecological transformation. And we have with Degrowth Vienna a very strong um, civil society organization. And in 2020, we had the Degrowth Conference here in Vienna. It was unfortunately online, but almost 4,000 um, people participated and many, many others. ÖFSE is an important player here since one of its research foci is resource politics in North South perspective and a dimension which is often forgotten here in Austria and in Europe. And the International Karl Polanyi Society is one space and one actor that brings us together. Many thanks in the name of ÖFSE and other collaborators here that um, the, the society is organizing this event and um, also offers this chair to uh, Julia. What makes Julia's work so important, uh, in my view, is the global and international perspective. When it comes to alternatives, we have many, many studies of the global scale of our problems, but all too often the alternatives are thought, imagined and worked out at national scales, perhaps at the European Union. But the low carbon well-being is a global aim and a global challenge. Because if we don't see this, we run the danger now with the decarbonization initiatives in Europe that we kind of invent a form of new, a green colonialism, green extractivism. So degrowth also needs decolonial perspectives and truly global perspectives. And Julia stands also for a scientific and social positioning of a researcher that um, has political impacts and that we need to organize our political impacts. And Julia was a main figure at the recent conference on degrowth in the European Parliament in Brussels. So again, a warm welcome also in the name of ÖFSE. This is not only the Karl Polanyi um, lecture, but also the development lecture of ÖFSE. Julia, keep calm, it's only one lecture. <laughs> but uh, I'm also happy to announce this and I um, wish us a nice um, evening. Marina Fischer-Kowalski is a retired professor, founder and long-term head of SECTE Institute for Social Ecology, now part of the Vienna University of Life Sciences, the second co-organizer of this event. She was president of the International Society for Ecological Economics and has contributed intensely to social ecology as a proper research field. We are delighted that she will give the laudatory speech for Julia Steinberger, the current Vienna Karl Polanyi visiting professor. Professor Fischer Kowalski, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
let me start with a personal recollection. In 2006, Julia came to our institute for her curiosity about a theoretically founded and empirical fruitful approach to social ecology. She obviously had always been interested environmentally and politically, but as a trained physicist, she wanted to learn more about the functioning of society. And she hoped to find this with us, which was very big compliment to us. She was digging herself into the literature at a speed that was kind of breathtaking, not least uh, Bolani's great transformation. I think you read it there, but I'm, I don't know. <laughs> she appreciated our team's interdisciplinarity, well interdisciplinary, well-organized and egalitarian structure. And I found her as a scientist and as a person a perfect fit to our team. We could offer her little but a position as senior scientist uh, to be financed by research money, which worked. Uh, Julia came in handy with her superior control of mathematics and modeling and made efforts to train some of us in MATLABs. I think, I don't know how big this success was. I remember sitting in the dawn and deep into the night with her cracking numbers to make two calculations, two approaches converge to the same conclusion. I could easily have been living with the slight deviations she found. So, she, Julia is a person with strict principles. For example, she was hanging a bell around the neck of her cat when letting him out. It should warn the mice and prevent them from being eaten. <laughs> this displays her sense for justice. You, you should not allow a well-fed pet to have fun but kill prey that was to find all food on its own in urban courts. I'm afraid I'm not as just. <laughs> Unfortunately for our team, after two years of her stay, she had to make new choices. With a love in Manchester and the plan for a baby, Vienna was off roads. She continued her career at the Sustainability Research Institute at the University of Leeds, where she finally had a position as professor of social ecology, which I was very proud of, and ecological economics. But life for her became increasingly complicated, if I remember correctly. Living in Manchester with a baby, working in Leeds, and her husband getting a new position at CERN in Geneva, where her parents also lived, resulted in a multitasking, multi-traveling life, not untypical for female scientists, but health-threatening. So finally, she could simplify her life by becoming professeur ordinaire for societal challenges of climate change, no social ecology there, at the University of Lausanne, with kid and husband pair and parents relatively close by. Across these various positions, Julia's key research interests kept, kept circling around, as she puts it, the current and historical linkages between resource use and socioeconomic parameters, very dry formulation, to identify alternative development pathways to inform the transition to a low carbon society. I think she wants more than that. I leave it to her to explain this. Our further collaboration, both with me personally and with other members of our Vienna team continued in jointly organizing conferences in such nice places like Iceland, mutual presentations and personal visits. Each occasion offered additional insights in Julia's incredible and for me sometimes almost frightening brilliance and further scientific development. Across the past week, I spent many hours reading and partly rereading through her articles. In her earlier work, she seems to have focused on refining her core concepts, such as elaborating on human needs 
as eudaimonic, a finite number of non-substitutable needs, instead of hedonic, which drives growth. She relates this to her specific understanding of energy demand with, with energy services as need satisfiers, and therefore efficiency in energy service delivery as a key, which allows a double decoupling between welfare and energy use. Increasingly, she focuses on how to translate analysis into policies to achieve just socio-ecological transformation. I find it admirable, admirable how Julia strives at disentangling political and economic capitalist growth imperatives by identifying practicable policies. For example, towards the establishment of societal boundaries as a necessary complement to planetary boundaries by Rockstream. And how the large team of authors she's part of in this particular article that I'm referring to analyzes the ambiguous role of democratic states in such a process. In Julia's work, the struggle for another great transformation, Polanyi, is ongoing. But after these personal remarks, I now leave the floor for herself to explain her agenda much better than I could. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it is now my honor uh, first to congratulate uh, Professor Julia Steinberger for being becoming the Vienna or awarded the Vienna Karl Polanyi Visiting Professorship. Uh, and we have yeah, uh, a small present for you. And now I leave the floor to you. Thank you and so to much. the presentations we all were looking forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andreas, and, and thanks to. Uh, to yourself as, as the main organizer, to Julia and Leah who've been working behind the scenes, to the other people who've been organizing this, this, uh, this visit and, and making it work, um, to, to Ulrich, to Marina, to Jürgen for introducing, um, to all the different organizations who are too, there are too many to list um, at this point, I think. And, uh, and also to all of you here, and I realize that I am now standing between a room full of Viennese people and their evening drinks. So I, uh, I believe we should get on with it. But I should also, yes, no, I, um, and thanks to the, to the International Karl Polanyi Society and to the, the family of, uh, of Karl Polanyi and his daughter, um, so which is really a, a, a very important and touching legacy. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's get on with things. Um, and, and also I'm extremely intimidated because you do things here in Vienna in a way that is grander and more official than I am used to, so it's all quite frightening. Um, and there is no way I can possibly live up to anything that's been said, so we will just get on with it. Um, okay, so the, the, the idea of this talk is basically to give you a summary of some of the headline results from a research project um, that in some ways started here when I was working with Marina at the Institute of Social Ecology and is continuing into the future and I'll sort of tell you what's happening here in the middle. So the question is living well within limits, is it possible and what will it take? Um, so the, basically the first thing I need to do is catch you up a little bit. Uh, so we're going to go through some of the first results quite fast and then we'll spend a bit more time on the newer results because I find them personally more interesting because they're newer. Okay, so the stylized facts are, the first one is this high plateau. So if you've never looked at the relationship between energy and well-being, um, it doesn't actually matter. You used to, you worked five seconds ago. Oh, it doesn't work anymore. This is very sad. Uh, it's okay. Uh -huh. Now it works again. Yay. 
Okay, so um, you can have any old uh, indicator of well-being. Here it happens to be the Human Development Index. You can have any old indicator of per, per, per capita energy use. Here it happens to be electricity in kilowatt hours. And the shape is always basically the same. The shape of this curve is that at low energy, things are very steep. So you give people in this zone of the plot a bit more energy, and you can expect their well-being to go up, their Human Development Index to go up reasonably steep. And then at a certain level, it just does not matter anymore. Things sort of flatten out. So that's the, the first stylized fact, is what I would call the high plateau. Um, and uh, I'm very fond of this plot. But that's sort of the first thing, is that the, the relationship is different at different levels of, en of, of energy. Um, the, second, uh, the second stylized fact is the dynamic decline, which is that you might think, if we go back to the previous plot, that countries would develop along this curve that as they grow in energy use, they would basically go along this curve in terms of their well-being levels. And the fact is that that's not what happens. In fact, at different points in time, the countries define new versions of this curve, which means that over time, the energy threshold associated with any given level of well-being decreases dramatically over time. And so you can see sort of this was again with Human Development Index. This is a result from 2010 already. You can see that the energy level dropping um, uh, so here you have energy use over, uh, here you have time now, here you have energy per capita. You can see that this thing sort of drops over time quite dramatically. So the energy associated with any given level of human development or well-being drops over time. Um, and this can even be used as the, this de de decline is so steady that you can actually use, as at, use it at the as a basis for scenarios. And that's something that people did um, in a couple of cases at least. The third stylized fact is multidimensional diversity. So there are a few countries here that are at low resource use, low energy use, or low carbon emissions per capita, um, and have reasonably high, in this case, life expectancy. And the question is, um, who are those countries? What do they represent? What do those societies represent? And there were some people who were basically saying, oh, well, they're all going to be tropical islands where people don't need energy for cooling or heating or anything. And, you know, they could just pick pineapples off of trees. And, you know, they, and, and that's not true, actually. Um, so they're, they're, they actually represent a, a diversity of types of countries, types of political regimes, types of histories. So that's possibly interesting as well. The only place that is not represented in that corner are the core rich economies, the yellow core rich economies. If you're super rich, uh, core economy, you do not get to be in there. Um, okay, so if you want to go beyond stylized facts, what do you need to do? Um, if you want to go beyond stylized facts, you sort of need to open the black box. And for that, you need to have an analytic framework. And that's what we did within the Living Well Within Limits project, which we shortened to Lily. So within the Living Well Within Limits framework, we have this idea. So the, our, our view of the economy is that it is indeed embedded into um, social, syst uh, social systems and environmental systems. But we sort of stretch it out here. We have biophysical inputs on one hand with planetary processes and natural resources. We have social outcomes on the other hand with need satisfiers and well-being. And in the middle, we have this object called provisioning systems, which is an object of heterodox econo economics. And I was ex uh, explaining earlier today how this, this, this framework is really us trying to get away from mainstream economics in order to analyze this system. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Maybe the most important part of the, the provisioning systems is that they're integrated physical and social objects. We're not just studying them as physical. We're not just studying them as social or economic. We're, we're studying them together. Um, okay, and, uh, and this is what Marina was talking about before, this idea of need satisfiers uh, underpinning well-being. That's a eudaimonic perspective on well-being, and we follow uh, Ian Guff and Len Doyle and Manfred Maxneef. Okay, so um, one of the first things we did, um, we, and this was a work that was led by Dan O'Neill, who many of you know, is we wanted to see empirically if it was possible to live within the donut. So if you could find... Uh, so probably most of you are familiar with Kate Rayworth's donut, but the idea is you stay within planetary boundaries, that's the outside ring of the donut, and you also want to reach the social foundation, that's the inside ring of the donut, and the question is, is any country currently in the safe and just space for humanity? And um, the answer is no, but we'll get to that. So, so basically we come up with data that looks a bit like this. So basically in this plot, red is bad. Um, and uh, so you see that, for instance, this is a country like France, Austria is probably very similar, where you see a lot of red on the outside, so France is transgressing a lot of planetary boundaries, and you see m not that much red on the inside, um, 
but some. So, you know, most of the social foundations are, are acquired in French society, whereas a country like Sri Lanka has no red at all on the outside, um, but quite a bit of red on the inside. So no planetary boundaries transgressed, but quite a few social, and quite a few social thresholds not achieved. So um, when we put all of that data together, basically this is the countries in the world that had an, the data that we could use, enough data for us to plot them on this. You look at basically every time a country transgresses a biophysical boundary, you bump it up one chunk, one, one increment on the horizontal axis. Every time it achieves a social threshold, you bump it up one uh, level on the social threshold, on the vertical axis, and basically things look like this. Um, we can see France up there. Austria is just above it. Austria is doing better than France on the social um, indicators. Go, go, go Austria. Uh, Sri Lanka is over here. And, um, and so you can see that, that, that this, this population, this space, for instance, where um, countries achieve a lot of social goodness, but at the cost of a lot of transgressing a lot of social uh, planetary boundaries is populated. There are a lot of neighbors there. This is in, you, you have lots of different countries. Um, the area where Sri Lanka is, where you don't transgress a lot of planetary boundaries, but you also don't achieve a lot of social thresholds, is also an inhabited, inhabited neighborhood. Human society and human organization being what it is in our day and age, the worst of both worlds is also an inhabited space in this plot. So you can transgress basically quite a few planetary boundaries and not really have anything social to show for it. That's really a pity. And where we need to be is the conspicuously empty space on this plot. So the, the deserted neighborhood um, where there's really a lot of room um, if you're there, where you achieve social thresholds and you don't transgress planetary boundaries, it's empty. And the question then becomes, how do we go from wherever we are now to there? And when Kate Rayruth saw this plot, she wasn't happy, uh, because who would be happy about this? But she made, one of her conclusions was, we are all developing countries now. And I think that that's one of the things, is that we all have quite a ways to travel, regardless of where we are now. Um, okay, so one of the problems with... Um, National data, the kind of data that was shown in the previous plot, is national averages. And national averages hide a lot of crimes, right? So one of the first things we want to do, if we want to understand how we can get deeper into that, is we need to sort of stretch out national average data into um, in a, more, more distributions and looking at the role of inequalities, right? So that that's, was a really big part of what we wanted to do within the Living Well Within Limits project. And so this is not one of our results, but it's just much better um, uh, graphics than we came up with. So um, that it just, it just you know, gives the, the, the kind of information that we're looking for, which is, and that's from the UNEP emissions gap report in 2020, uh, which had a chapter on inequality that was really great. And that shows now the, the world population is now just divided into percentiles, right? income percentiles, and you're sort of estimating the CO2 emissions associated with those percentiles. So this is the top 1% is, you know, think Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whatever, or even worse. Um, then the top 10% is purple, and purple includes red. That's one of the things to understand here. Then the bottom, middle, bottom 40%, and bottom 50% of income earners. And you can see that the, levels, the level of inequality is really huge. And this has macro implications, right? So if you look at the, the, this pie, this ring here, represents global carbon emissions for the year 2015. And the estimate from this study was that 15% of the global CO2 emissions were, um, could be attributed to the top 1% of income earners. If you take the top 10%, which again includes the top 1%, you're up to 48% of emissions, so half um, uh, half of CO2 emissions um, can be attributed, you know, to the top richest 10%, probably includes a reasonable fraction of people in this room, except if you're a PhD student, in which case I'm sorry. Um, and, um, uh, and by the time you get to the, to the bottom 50% of humanity, um, their, the, their share of emissions was only 7%. And if you were keeping track to three seconds ago, that's less than half of what the 1% is responsible for. And I think that this, this plot, I always try to include it because it answers the population question quite well. You know, is climate change a population problem? Yes, but not any population, right? 
a certain a certain selected few population could could help us a lot if they um, did things differently. So um, so we sort of uh, um, we 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 then did a study. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the layout on the, on the slides is confusing me a bit, but I think it's, it's, it's still legible. Um, so we did a study that was published um, in 2020 in Nature Energy. It was the first paper of Yannick Oswald's PhD, um, where basically what we were able to do is we were able to look at this inequality in so many different dimensions. It was really cool. Um, so we're using multi-regional input-output with um, energy extensions, so final energy extensions, uh, which allows us to do energy footprinting. And we're dividing it not only across different countries, so we have 86 countries in this sample that go from the most affluent to the least affluent, so it's a good spread, even though it's not all countries in the world. And within those countries, we have different income classes. And within those different income classes, we have different things that they spend money on. And this gives us a lot of data, and it's very exciting. And so basically, it tells us the energy footprint that different income classes spend on different pro types of product. And when we're looking, uh, what, it, what it allows us to do is it allows us to do something like this plot where we're basically mapping product categories by their energy intensity, i.e. their ability to pollute in, once you buy them in the economy, and their inequality. So I'm just going to walk you through it. The top of this plot, uh, the top half, is our categories that have an elasticity above one, income elasticity above one, which means that they are disproportionately consumed by rich people, rich households. The bottom half are products that are disproportionately consumed by poor people. Rich people consume more of everything. So this is it's a share of budget question, right? Um, so, and then on the... Um, on the horizontal axis, on this side, you have high energy intensity, which means more energy used per dollar spent in the economy. And on this half, you have less energy per dollar spent in the economy. And if I'm spending this much time on this plot, is because before Yannick came along and did it, I was dreaming about doing this, for, I think, for about five years. And I was really happy when, I did it, when he did it, because I was like, oh, what are we going to see? You know, what are, what are, we're just, we're just going to make a mess. It's just going to be beautiful. What, what, what are we going to see? And what we see is, in fact, much cleaner than what I thought. I did not expect to see this that, for instance, in this very interesting luxury and high-intensity quadrant, what we see are transport categories. We see all the transport categories, and we see only transport categories. Whether it's flying, package holiday is, is a, a category that is flying, vehicle purchase, vehicle fuel, other kinds of transport. So the, um, what we're seeing is that when people have excess income, they spend it on bigger cars, they take longer trips, they take the plane more. So you really see that transport is the average direction that richer households spend their excess money on. Um, and we see this in all over the world, pretty much. So, so it's really a very strong pattern. Whereas to the contrary, the, the, this, the, the, the category with the highest energy intensity that is disproportionately consumed by poor people or poorer households is um, heat and electricity, which is energy use in buildings. So you see this real split between transport on the one hand and, and dwellings um, habitat on the other. And I think that that's something to take very seriously because one of the things it means is from this demand perspective, from this use perspective, we need to think differently about our policies, right? So this is a problem that you do not get rid of with green growth. So that's one of the things you need to do, is you need to do things like taxation and regulation. This is a problem that you do not get rid of. Um, it's, the, the, the people who are spending money on heat and electricity do not want to be spending money on heat and electricity. They are doing it because it is necessary for their comfort, it is necessary for their health, it is necessary to have a decent way of life. And so they are not going to be capable to themselves change their living conditions to not use that energy. So this is something where you obviously need some kind of public investment in decarbonized energy, you need public investment in efficiency, uh, heat pumps, etc. So the, it's the, the, the fact that energy is used in, in such different ways in, um, means that you, you, you need to also think about it differently in, in that sense. Um, so um, just because I hate cars, I'm just going to show you this one. There's actually an no, I mean, seriously, right? Um, so uh, the, 
the, the, the, there's been an updated version of this, um, which basically looks the same except worse. So just imagine this is even worse. This shows, um, it's in a study from the IAA that shows the additional CO2 emissions in the world due to different sources, right? In the last decade, roughly. So since 2010. And what you can see is that the biggest one is power, it's electricity. You would expect that. You would expect, hey, people are going to use CO2 for something, they're going to make, make electricity with it. Good. That's sort of a use that we can sort of agree is reasonable. However, the next one, the next biggest source of CO2 emissions is SUVs. It's just vehicles that are stupidly larger, more dangerous, and more wasteful than they have to be, right? There is no, nobody in the world uh, needs this. And you can even see that all other cars are actually decreasing in comparison. So you see that this, this tendency of overconsumption in the transport sector is really, um, is really uh, an international planetary scale problem. You also have aviation in there as well, but it's further down. So really this, this emphasis on over heavy cars is, uh, is a big problem. Uh, Switzerland's the worst in Europe, by the way. Um, worse than Germany, worse than Austria. Um, oh yeah, and, and uh, the, the conclusion of Tim, Oc Tim Gore of Oxfam, um, basically governments must curb the emissions of the wealthy through taxes and bans, revenues should be invested in public services, etc. Very reasonable stuff, not happening. Um, so the, 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 the other thing I want to, um, to, to, to mention in terms of inequality, this is a beautiful recent results by Marta Baltrushevitz. It was published, I think, in January in Ecological Economics. And um, it's a beautiful study in so many different ways, but I think I'm only going to talk about one of them tonight. Um, and the, the graph comes from Carbon Brief. Uh, the, so they made a beautiful plot that I can share with you. Although Marta's plots are also very beautiful. I shouldn't have said it that way. Anyway, so onwards. We have the deciles. These, these, these 1 to 10, these bars 1 to 10 correspond to the decile, income deciles um, in the UK. And then you can see what they actually use their energy on uh, because of Marta's footprinting works, a household level footprinting work. And one of the things that's super interesting is you can see that this category of housing, uh, here you really see sort of an exam a very dramatic example of how equal, how equal the energy level used in housing is. Now, what's interesting here is that, of course, the people down here do not get the same energy services for the same energy use as the people up here. The people up here can afford windows, retrofit, whatever. They're going to get a lot more comfortable square meters with their energy use than the people down here, but still, overall, the level is quite similar. And where you can really see this huge inequality is in flights, and car transportation. So that's where you really see the inequality taking off, is in these transport categories. So this just sort of to show you at the scale of one country what that kind of thing looks like. And um, the inequality is so extreme um, that the richest 10% use more energy in flights than the poorest 20% use total. So th this is really sort of a macro uh, problem in terms of how, how, how we're distributing resources. Um, Okay, so next question. Uh, we were sort of interested in trying to understand what factors enable or disable uh, societies for achieving well-being at low resource use. And um, so we're using this framework uh, for real. And so, and I don't think I'm going to talk you through this equation. We basically use um, <laughs> multiple variables and we have an interaction term. And the reason the interaction term is cool is it because it allows us to set domains of validity. It allows you to say this variable is significant in this parameter space and not significant in another parameter space. So that's cool. It's a paper that was published in 2021 by Yefim Fogel, and we're including this, um, this aspect of, uh, of provisioning, provisioning factors, so socioeconomic or political factors that might have an influence in how need satisfaction is associated with energy use. And the way it works is, if you think about those saturation curves I showed you before, at the very, very beginning of the talk, um, it, this, this is sort of what they look like, right? They look steep at, the, steep at the beginning, then flat at the top. A high value of a beneficial provisioning factor will shove that curve up. It will basically make it easier for societies to achieve need satisfaction at low energy use, right? It will basically... Um, move things up, and a detrimental factor will pull that curve down and make it harder for societies to achieve 
uh, need satisfaction at lower energy use. And basically, things the, the, this is the modeling he did, but not, I don't think I'm going to go into it. But basically, uh, Yefim um, in this paper identified multiple um, very significant positive factors. And the positive factors were things like public service availability, um, equality, so lack of inequality, democracy, um, electricity and sanitation access, so basically network infrastructure access. So there are a lot of positive things. And one of the things that we can see in the project as a whole is that public services, if there's one thing that you might remember from tonight, public services are the linchpin protecting populations of, uh, against lower resource use. The more high quality public services you have, the more people, the more societies are able to deliver good living conditions to their population at low resource use. And that's something that we see internationally, it's something that we see intranationally, it's, it's basically, we also, when we're trying to do modeling, we see it as well, because we sort of have to um, provide this stuff. Um, we also identified negative factors. Now, one negative factor that came out extremely strongly was extractivism, which means the direct dependency of an economy on things like mining and fossil fuel extraction. Um, that's a known economic phenomenon. It's known as the resource curse or Dutch disease. Or it's got a bunch of names. We see it here too. So, okay, fun. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's just you, you sort of expect it, but it really falls out of the data. And the other thing that we see is that, which actually kind of surprised us, is that economic growth above a moderate income um, is a negative factor. So societies that are growth-oriented, once they've achieved a, negative, a certain level of income, have a harder time providing need satisfaction to their population at lower energy use. So when you think about, if you think about societies as machines with knobs, and as a physicist, that's how I'd really like to see them, um, you can start thinking about the knobs you want to turn up, and you can start thinking about the knobs you want to turn down. You can start thinking about the Frankenstein sort of robot picture of what a society might look like that allows you to have good living conditions at lower resource use. You want more public services, equality, democracy, um, you know, network infrastructure access. You want less extractivism. You want less growth orientation, at least if you've reached a moderate income. So that's, that's one interesting thing. Um, now, we've modeled um, low energy and high well-being, so we just made up a world where we could do this. This is based on the decent living energy framework of Professor Narasimha Rao of Yale University. It's very uh, closely related to the work of Jarmo Kikstra, who's in the audience today, and he's done an um, extraordinarily beautiful paper in 2021 um, that, that um, um, pushes us quite a bit further as well. But basically what our model does is it connects needs to sufficient levels of energy services. It's a global model. And one of the things we do is we take into account real technologies, like they're, they're, they're efficient, they're where you could expect technology to be, but they are not made up. They are real things that you could expect the world to be doing. Uh, so these are not imaginary technologies, which is a thing that you have to say, given the fact that a lot of models include negative emissions technologies. And um, equal distribution. So everybody has enough, nobody has more than enough. Um, what the model takes into account is it takes into account um, things like nutrition, shelter, clothing, mobility, communication, information, healthcare, education. Uh, freedom and air quality, we weren't able to sort of model, but we put them there because we cared about them, but even though we weren't able to model them. And you sort of have direct energy, uh, embodied energy, so gray energy. You have public infrastructures like hospital and schools. You have private infrastructures like office retails and uh, uh, offices and freight and stuff like that. And then you have infrastructure, infrastructure, which is just like all the stuff you need. And Joel Milward Hopkins tried to model all of that stuff. and. He came up with, a, um, with, with, with ways of doing that. The, the model, you sort of have to set levels per person, but they depend on things like demography, you know, age structure, household size, whether or not people live in rural or urban areas, climate, including some warming, um, et cetera. And uh, what we find, um, just as sort of the, the result for this, is that if you, the, the, the Decent living energy, so the, this is as low as you could go, right? This is a highly hypothetical, utopian or dystopian, depending on your politics, 
extremely equal, extremely sort of technologically advanced society where everybody has enough and nobody has too much. So it's how low you can go without hurting anybody, right? If you're equally distributed. Um, and that's the, 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 the green arrow here in terms of energy use. So it's around 150, 160 uh, exajoules. So our current global final energy use is shown along the black curve here. Um, with the reference scenario of the International Energy Agency. So we're sort of around, you know, four, somewhere upwards of 400 exajoules. And this model says that in 2050, we could actually supply people with a lot less in good, in decent conditions where nobody feels, you know, physical harm from their, from their, from their living conditions, which is uh, quite interesting. And you can see that when you look at different countries, um, Quite a few countries are way below that, which is obviously horrible, and those people are not living well. The countries that are currently above it don't necessarily live well because of inequalities and because of technological deficiency, right? You can be using a lot of energy in a very wasteful way. So both of these things mean that, you know, below, um, you know, some, somewhere around this level, it's probably going to be hard for people to meet their needs. But in theory, it could be uh, in the near future. So a good life for all within planetary limits may be technically possible. Um, then the question is, okay, well, let's think about what's standing in our way. And maybe this is where we also start rejoining, uh, rejoining Karl Polanyi, because we have to think about the ways our, our current economies are embedded in our social systems and what they're doing to our environment. And so to do this, we decided to study this heterodox economic object of provisioning systems, and we decided to, uh, to do um, a systems of provision type of study of these provisioning systems. We only had enough funding to do a, a bit of it, um, but it was, it was still quite interesting. And the method systems of provision was developed by Ben Fine and Kate Bayliss, and so we were lucky enough to work with Kate Bayliss on the project. And Ben Fine was actually one of the people who was also in our advisory board, and he, he was really very supportive. So the, the, short, the short answer here is that provisioning systems could enable good lives at low resource use. However, they're often engineered to create resource dependency. So what you have here is something that could be, that could be organized in a different way, and that is currently organized in a way that creates resource dependency and that drives escalating resource use. Um, the other thing to understand is the history of this, that the dependency on resource-intensive consumption is itself an industrial product, which is driven by decades of lobbying, subsidies, and state regulatory capture. And that's one of the things that you see when you study these systems of provision, is you see sort of how certain provisioning systems came to sort of take hold of the government, of its processes, of its budgets. And that's, that's one of the things that, that we tried to look at. So the, um, the system of provision uh, of political economy of car dependency and the, the upside down pentagram sort of tells you how we think of cars within the project. <laughs> we don't like them. I hope that was subtle enough. Um, so uh, so uh, this was a, pro a work that was led by Giulio Maccioli um, with a uh, lot of support from Cameron Roberts, myself and Andrew Brown at the University of Leeds. And, and Giulio Maccioli, who's an expert in transport systems, immediately said, listen, if we want to look at this, we need to look at the car industry, we need to look at roads and parking, we need to look at land use and how land use is organized, uh, we need to look at the active neglect of public transportation, and we also need to look at the creation of car culture. We need to look at these five things together and understand how they work together over time to create this thing of car dependence. Um, and so that's what we did, and it, uh, Julia was working on it for so many years, he started calling, we started calling it the opus, which is never good when you're trying to write an academic paper. But in the end, it was published in 2020, and I think it's really good. It's just a bit long, but each, just take each section as a chapter, basically. Okay? And so, and, and I decided to make a cartoon version of it also. So here's the basic idea. Is, these are ants. I hope you can see in the back. Um, basically, the way we're taught to see the economy it is this, this market idea is that the market is sort of the flat surface of the sea. And you have a bunch of producers who are making different flavored, let's call it beer. Um, 
in this case. So they're all making different beer and they're pouring it into the market and the consumers all get, who are also ants, they all get to drink different flavored beer and they're all very happy, everybody's happy. And, um, and the point being that they're ants, nobody is a price maker, everybody is a price taker. Nobody is big enough to influence the behavior of the whole system, right? That's sort of what, the way we're supposed to, to see the system. And in the case of car dependence, of course, what that means is that we have consumers who want cars, they want cars of a certain type, and they buy them, and that's just the way the world works. Of course, the reality from a perspective of, and this is, I'm very, very sorry for my artistic skills, but I just find this a, a convenient way to communicate. Um, so this is a cartoon version of the economy as vertical supply chains connected through technology clusters. And of course, one of the big um, theoretical proponents of technology clusters is Arnold Grubler at Yaza. Um, but, but so the, the idea here is that one of the things we really see, for instance, in this study, is that you have different industries like oil, roads, cars, and suburban real estate that are all tied really very close together and that basically produce a uniformity. And they, and, they, and they really work together in the way that they organize policy, that they organize subsidies, that they sort of organize the vision of the society that they're trying to bring forward together and organize the culture as well. And the role of the state, what is the state doing here? Well, the state's basically a scaffolding. He's holding the whole thing up to make sure that it's stable and, and just keeps working that way. And in the end, the market is much more like a funnel with, a, with very little freedom of choice, right? Where everybody ends up driving away in their car. So that's sort of one of the things that we're seeing is we're basically, when we look at the system of provision of car dependence, we're seeing the establishment of these different vertically integrated, um, this vertically integrated economy across these different sectors. And it sort of tells us what we're up against. And if you're wondering, the solution is more public transportation. What this looks like in text format, and this is why I included the, 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 the cartoon, because this is, the, the previous plot was maybe artistically terrible, but in, at least more interesting than this. But basically what we come up with is this summary of the cause and effect, the sort of between the automotive industry, car infrastructure, land use patterns, undermining of public transportation, car culture. And we sort of can fill out each one of these boxes with sort of cause and effect relationships. And we're really basically doing an anatomy of carbon lock-in and the way it sort of solidifies itself um, in our societies. In terms of uh, looking at privatization of public services, we were looking at electricity and bus transportation, especially in the UK. Um, we had this study where we looked, again, a system of provision analysis, looking at the state, providers and investors and consumers, the processes and narratives for privatization, including, you know, homo economicus on the customer side, uh, the efficiency narrative on the producer side, um, deregulation um, and market competition as a justification for the regulator. And the reality being a reality of rent extraction, of powerful incumbents that re refuse re-regulation and do a lot of lobbying, and in cost increases on the consumer side. So that's sort of the, the things that we can see from this. And this study actually uh, was a very proud moment as far as I was concerned. Um, led to this statement, uh, it was sort of the basis for this statement and Phil, Al Phil Ep Alston, who is a uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, in his UK visit, and I will just read it because I think it's true. Abandoning people to the private market in relation to services that affect every dimension of their basic well-being without guaranteeing their access to minimum standards is incompatible with human rights requirements. And I think that that's something that we need to think about quite a lot. Of course, the, US gov the, US, the UK government refused his report and made an international stink about it and lodged a complaint against him, I believe because they are grown-ups. Um, so um, the next step of this research, uh, we were fortunate enough, so myself, Yorgos Kallis, and Jason Hickel, um, to get an ERC Synergy grant. So um, in, we, re we received it in October last year. I have to tell you honestly, I never thought we had a chance. I did the work. I think we wrote a good proposal but I didn't think we'd get it because we never get things like that, but we did, so it's kind of exciting. And I think it's a pretty cool project, so I'm very happy about this. It's probably the largest degrowth, post-growth project um, ever funded, and it's not the only one. It's sort of like there are a whole bunch of different projects coming together that have, are either coming down the line or are currently funded ERC projects, Horizon projects that are doing this kind of stuff. So it's actually a very exciting time, and we really need to make the most of it because God knows it's late in coming, right? From a, from a physics perspective, 
the fact that we only have growth-based economic models that function is an honest, is really a, really a big problem. So we need to have other types of models. This is one of the things that we'll be doing here. We'll be looking at um, post-growth policies for global north and global south. We'll be looking at north-south conversions a lot. We'll be to look, um, in particular, I'm interested in this post-growth provisioning, so work package three is mine, looking at uh, determinants of social progress, democratic provision alternatives, and um, what modeling transformed provision would look like. So basically, if we expand democratic um, I function into the economic sphere and try to break up this vertical economy, what does that look like? And post-growth politics and post-growth in practice. And um, yeah, so this is just some of the, the things we want to do. We want to do some more modeling uh, where we'll basically for the first time have post-growth pathways that uh, we can sort of explore. Po uh, post-growth policy deals as a, as a counterpoint to the Green New Deal for Europe and the Global South and bridge the gap between theory and implementation. That's all very ambitious. Um, in terms of, yeah, who knows if we'll get there. Um, so uh, from analysis to rebellion, I always end my talks with this. I think that um, it's very good to do science and analysis, but I think it's also time to uh, go into the streets and I took the warning, the, the statement of Charlie Gardner and Claire Worldly very much to heart. So the scientists who alerted the world to the climate and ecological crises have a moral duty to join the popular movements demanding political action, including civil disobedience. We wrote a paper on the role of the university and how it could change from publications to public actions. Get it? Fun, it's funny. We put a pun in. We could not be trying harder. And also, also to stand with... Um, environmental, uh, so protesters and activists who are being criminalized around the world. I think that we at universities have a, particularly, a particular responsibility to... Okay. Yeah, and so I'll leave it there. Thank you. You're now standing between yourselves and beer. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia, for this brilliant speech. Uh, we have the honor to have one more uh, participant, uh, Daniel Hoopman, as our commentator. Yeah? Daniel is Senior Research Scholar at IASA, the International Institute for Applied si System Analysis at Luxembourg. He has published widely on climate change and integrated assessments, and currently he's co-chair of the second Austrian assessment report, which will be published in 2025. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, talk about big shoes to fill. Um, thank you very much for a, a thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, you made a, an amazing arc in your presentation uh, from the needs for a good life, um, the, the need satisfiers, the provisioning systems, and you reminded us all that we're probably using a bit more resources here in this lecture hall, except for the PhD students that don't... That, those that don't have it started their PhDs, but we're using probably more resources than we should be. You went from this needs um, to the planetary boundaries and how that will limit sooner or later our growth um, and the amount of resources that we can use. And you then weave in the inequality, both globally, which we are very much aware of, I think, but in particular nationally, which we are probably less aware of. So I'm grateful for bringing in that perspective. Um, what I found most compelling in your presentation was the 
um, slide where, where you showed transport is something being driven by rich people, driven literally speaking, um, versus buildings is something that is more by poor people who do not have a choice, and you translated that into very concrete policy recommendations, um, which was, I think, thought-provoking how to go from a very simple elasticity evidence analysis to very obvious policy choices, and somebody should tell our chancellor about that because I think he's currently walking in a different direction, um, or driving in a different direction, I should say. Um, <laughs> Well, he's not alone in that. There are plenty of other parties that are in the driver's seat there as well. Um, and then from these planetary boundaries and uh, this inequality, you went to the institutions that lock us in the current system and the, that prevent us from moving towards a probably better, more equitable uh, society. And you showed cartoons and I think maybe people won't remember all the figures, but the cartoons everybody re will remember. And there are now two questions that are spinning around in my head that maybe we can discuss later or over a beer uh, once I'm done talking. Um, and sorry for standing between you and beer now after Julia left the stage. Um, there are two questions that are spinning in my head and I just want to throw them out quickly. Um, I'm a modeler myself. I'm a growth modeler, not a post-growth modeler. At IASA we have integrated assessment models and we do uh, scenarios like, in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, we have to limit emissions by 50% until 2030. And I'm wondering now, how can we combine everything that you have shown us with this kind of models? Is that even possible? Do we need a completely new set of model? And I'm thinking, well, I'll just add that to my model, because my model is great and can do everything. I just need to stick like a few more things and knobs, you called it, onto our model at YASA, but maybe that's not the right approach. Maybe we really need to start from scratch in order to have models that are relevant and that are useful to guide the, not just transition, but transformation. And now to my second question, do we even need models? We have models that are probably good enough to influence or to guide society and policymakers, and yet we are not on the wrong, uh, not on the right track. So are models, is modeling really the most effective way that we can serve society, which as researchers I'm convinced we should, and then taking cue to your last two slides, shouting fire if there's an actual fire is the right thing to do but as researchers we are trained to never shout but just go up the ivory tower and do some excellent research and write papers so how can we guide not just the transformation of society but also the transformation of our discipline how much activism should we be doing how much activism do we have to do and at the same time, science requires public trust. We've seen that during the COVID pandemic, uh, where that has been lacking, in particular in Austria. It's one of the aspects where in Austria we should probably not be proud of the skepticism towards science. So how can we at the same time shout fire and yet maintain and further establish the trust in society that we need as, as arbiters, as useful guidance to how a future could look like. And you have gone further than most researchers, um, really being activists to the point of being carried away by the police. Uh, so I would be really thankful for a few more words on how to navigate, as a humble researcher myself, uh, this transition between research and activism. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and congratulations to the uh, Polani Visiting Professorship. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Hoopman. Um, there is not only a response from your side, Julia, to, to these two questions that in between the present and the beer, there is uh, one round at least of questions uh, from the audience.
possible. Uh, and while I invite you to um, give the first, uh, first answers to Daniel, uh, I invite you to think about potential questions and after this first answer, uh, we'll open the floor to a few questions. Thanks, thanks Andreas, and uh, thanks, Daniel, for, for your kind words. Um, so I think the first question on, on, on models and IAMs and what we can do with existing and where we might need some, some entirely new ideas, I th I'm really looking forward to, that, to, to having those conversations and to having that dialogue between the new post-growth projects and uh, established modeling hubs like YASA and, and others. And, you know, we'll, I hope we'll have some time to talk on Thursday as well. And I, I think that that's one of the things that we need to discuss is, okay, we don't, we don't want to do more work than's necessary. Time is very short. We really need to collaborate on this. And so let's just have this open discussion of what we can do and what, what, we, what we can change and where we need to, to put, actually put some new pieces of kit in. And, of course, um, the, the question of do we need models, do we need research, don't we know enough, don't we just need to go out and change things? And then how does science serve society in that kind of context? I think that that's really, um, I think these are really important questions and I think that it's really important for each of us to be asking them for ourselves. Um, in the University of Lausanne, I had the extraordinary good luck and I should include the, um, that, that, uh, that, that reference, uh, but it's easy to find on the internet, that I had colleagues with much better brains doing the work for me, so it was awesome. And you can go and read their reports. So it turned out that when I arrived at the University in Lausanne in 2020, other professors had already gotten into huge amounts of trouble before me as part of Extinction Rebellion. They had founded, they had done amazing work. Uh, they founded the Doctors for, the Extinction, uh, Ex Doctors for Extinction Rebellion in Switzerland. They interacted with the World Health Organization as Doctors for Extinction Rebellion. They got uh, Tedros, um, the head of the, the World Health Organization, to read out their statement in plenary and say that this was the, this was the necessary direction for human health in the future. And uh, they also got themselves arrested a bunch of times and um, they got into a huge amount of trouble because Switzerland is a very conservative society and with threats of getting them, uh, have them, they should be fired and so on. And I had colleagues who did this re report on research and engagement. So if you search for University Lausanne research and engagement, you have this report that basically goes into what is scientific neutrality, and they conclude that it's nothing and it has never existed, and it's just completely, it's a term that is only used to beat people over the head when they challenge the status quo. Uh, what is scientific objectivity? That's something that's guaranteed by our methods and our, you know, our transparency in our process. And uh, what, does sci what does scientific engagement mean? So how do, how do we engage with society? And they say being an activist is engaging with society, but so is being a mainstream economist and going on television and saying we need more austerity. That is also engaging with society. And so we always have this responsibility of, of how we do things, uh, not just what. And so I think that that's, that for me, that report is sort of the gold standard in terms of thinking through these ideas, and I really highly recommend it. If you're about thinking about getting yourself into trouble, all the arguments you want are in there. So it's, very, it's a very helpful thing. But I think it's something that we really need to, to, to pay attention to. Um, just one point, I, I have colleagues, for instance, in the US or in different domains who say, oh, you need to be positive and optimistic when you communicate about you know, climate catastrophe. And I don't see that, I, I think that we need to be honest. I think the most important thing is that we need to be honest and transparent. This is what I think is happening based on what evidence. These are the conclusions I draw based on what evidence. This is my thinking process. So we can't, we, as scientists, we can't just say anything out there in the world. But we, I think we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to be honest with the people we're talking to. And I think the, the way we maintain credibility is also by being you know, we can make mistakes. It's possible to make mistakes in public. Like, being a scientist does not mean you don't make mistakes. It means you own up to your mistakes, right? When you make a mistake, you correct yourself and you explain what you did wrong. So we have these processes, and I think the process of making mistakes in public is probably something we should do a bit more of, just so people get used to knowing that we can be trusted because when we make a mistake, we correct it. 